Oh. What's up, everybody? Woo! What's up? Oh yeah, I forgot we have headphones today. I know, yeah. <laughs> Just making sure I got to the right one. I look way cooler in headphones. It's, or do I? I don't know. He can't. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. How is um, how's everybody doing in their respective states, counties, countries, whatever? You know, who's getting to go out more? Who's going out more? Who's not going out more? Where are we at with all this? I've been going hiking lately because as much as I love being in the studio, it drives me mad after a while. Ah, uh, there we go. Ooh. We have headphones on because we're going to play some stuff off the computer so we can actually hear what the heck is going on. Left on the left side. Don't want to be hearing a audience perspective. No. Speaking of audience perspective, drums should always be drummer's perspective. <laughs> Until I witness someone uh, air drumming rush, audience perspective, drums should always be um, drummer's perspective, period. Left to right. If you're if you're a left-handed drummer, well, you just, you know, uh, that's people a good, do audience perspective. That's a good question for the people on... Uh, online right now how many do audience or drummers perspective just type it in <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean ario went back to work this week he's in connecticut how are things there what's the vibe over there you know is it tense is it anxious do people want to get back out i know here i think people are starting to go nuts <laughs> Ralph, drama perspective, of course. Yeti's in Illinois, working at home for half pay. Sorry about the half pay, man. That blows. <laughs> City in this lockdown. <laughs> mm -hmm. Look, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome oh i tell you what this has you know we hadn't streamed in over a year from back when we were doing all the other broadcasts and the music chamber thing and all that and when we started right before the lockdown we decided hey we want to start doing this again and then the lockdown hit we went you know what let's just i know everybody's sitting at home we all got stuff to talk about stuff to show each other you know let's just see if we can get See who's out there still, and it's been a lot of fun hanging with all of you. There's been you've given us some cool stuff to look at too, which has been really nice. And why don't we? One thing too, down in the description, there is a link to the Facebook group. I know some of you guys are already on there, but if you're not, let's get on there and share some music. Share what's going on. I don't care if you're making music in a home studio by yourself. You got the band in the bedroom, whatever. You know, share what you're doing. Let's hear some music. Wow, look at that. We had 300 people outside the bike side of my outdoor retail store. Wow. Holy crap. Damn. Most impressive. So Yeti, Yeti, what do you do, man? Besides music, you work on. Do you is that actually trade show exhibit design? Is that what you do? That's kind of cool. Drummer's perspective is winning out. Uh, Wade says uh, Georgia here. We're free. <laughs> 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 nice and simple, right to the point. That's awesome. Yeah. No, my question Ralph's was... Ralph's drummer perspective. See, that's... We know. They know. Yeah, my question is for mixing drums. People like the hi-hat on the left, that's what the drummer hears, and then some people like the hi-hat on the right because that's what the audience sees. So Obviously, we're not talking about a left-handed drummer. Yeah. That just throws the whole thing out of whack. So it's, it's, it's a mixing decision you make. It's like, how do you hear the drums? That's it. Yeti, there is no such thing as gear you don't need. That just doesn't exist. I can't compute that. I may have steam coming out of my ears in a second. Everything I have, I need. <laughs> That's how I justify it anyway. <laughs> Audience perspective is for lefties. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I won a pair of Adam T8V last week. How the hell did you do that? lucky bastard obsidian thank you that's right everybody please hit the like button if you like it actually hit it if you don't like it 
Just because. Yeah. But don't hit the don't like button. <laughs> don't well, hit do, the don't, don't like button. <laughs> <laughs> Some Arrested Development stuff there. Look what Rudy says. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Okay, first off, now that we got things going, a little bit of announcement to start off with. As you can see, Ernesto and I are wearing the same shirt. That's not because we want to dress alike, but we have new, some new merch coming up. The Master Fader T-shirt. It is DB, DBU, by the way, not DBFS. Yes. So this is approximately minus 18 FS. <laughs> so don't that's, be like, wow, you're hitting, you You mix that hard? It's like, no, minus 18. <laughs> Maybe that's the next shirt we need to do is that. <laughs> so we have that. We have the no coffee, no recording coffee mug. I got links to that stuff down in the description that takes you over to the Ultimate Studios Inc. site that has all that fun stuff. And each month I'm going to come up with something new to get out. I'm going to try to be creative and have some fun with it. I got the coffee mug coming too. It just didn't show up in time today. So hopefully that'll be here here by the next one. As much coffee as I freaking drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, Adam says he won, he won the speakers in a free webinar and gave two sets away. My wife is thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's what it all comes down to. Yep, yep. Okay, today's topic. This is something that... Ernesto and I have been talking about uh, quite a bit lately and during some of these sessions and is a bit of an extension from the video that went up yesterday, which is the first part in the new EGH miniseries for the recording of Circus Tuesday. And the topic is building your mic locker and how that affects your mixes or mixing. Because For me, I think the recording process is the beginning of the mix process. So I'm making decisions on what I want things to sound like then and guiding everything else. That doesn't mean things don't change, but I never get to the mix process and go, oh, now what's, you know, how are we going to make this thing sound? It's already there. So every decision leading up to that. And I think one of the first and easiest decisions that can affect all of us is microphones, even more than preamps, even honestly more than your I.O., because it's right on the source, so it's capturing the way you play whatever the instrument is, drums, guitar, you know, bass, vocals. It's capturing that and has an immediate impact on the sound. So thinking about what mics you're using, what mics you're going to use, or figuring out what sound you don't have if you're not getting what you want is really important. And then going after that. Correct. Does that make sense? Correct. For instance, let me give you a scenario. On the video that went up yesterday, don't go watch it now. Stay with us. Watch it after this. We decided to record the guitars because we did all clean guitars for Circus Tuesday. And we decided to use our microphones as our EQs and our depth. All those two things at the same time. So all the rhythm guitars had three mics. There was a Unidyne. Three, which is freaking awesome. You guys heard that a you know a few weeks back on one of the broadcasts. The thing's great. I used a Roswell Mini Pro uh, Mini K eighty seven. So many things to remember. I'm saying things wrong. And then we had two different room mics. We had a Red Twelve from Twelve Gauge uh, Microphones and a an AT forty eighty one ribbon mic from Audio Technica. That those went on each side. So the left side got, I think, actually ended up being the 12 gauge, and the for the room mic, and the right side ended up being the Audio Technica 4081. So the stereo, as far as the room mic was concerned, was different. Now the other two mics we did not use at the same time. What we did was we we put them up there, and we knew we had parts of the song where it was rhythms but no melody, and we had parts where there were rhythms with the melody. So we decided to choose our microphones that would be the main source of the rhythms to either come forward a little bit and be the feature or sit back a little bit and let the melody come forward. In that case, between those two mics, it ended up being a, the Unidyne was actually brighter, thinner, and it was more forward. So that plus the room mic became our sound with no melody. When the melody came up, we switched to the Mini K87 
because it was rounder, a little bit smoother, not quite as bitey, and it let the melody come up a little bit. Now that was by design, but we do that a lot. I do that with my drums all the time. Every one of my sessions, I think about what mics I have. I'm not necessarily just going, what's the best mic for every single place? Because I might have a set of mics that I love as room mics, but it doesn't work with the rest of the kit. So I'm always thinking of where the depth is, what the options are. In this case, we wanted to use, we didn't want to fiddle later, as li or as little as possible anyway. And I ended up, well, you'll see the mixed video. It comes out next week. Well, a week from Monday. Monday's is Rick's bass video. Oh, he tears it up. But we choose it based on where we want it to sit so we don't have to fiddle too much later, right? It's capturing the mic, capturing the best sound at the source for what we want at that moment. Now, and interrupt me anytime if I'm, you, you yeah. think I'm talking out my butt. Now, one thing, that takes a little practice. I know in the beginning, and I, I know everybody that's watching, there's like different levels and experience here. So some of this, may you may be go, oh, yeah, I know this. And some may, you know, maybe you haven't quite thought this through yet. But I'm just going to speak from my experience. In the, When I started out doing this, I had whatever mics I had. And in my, my opinion there, the best mics to record with are the ones you have. And then you figure out from there what you need, not necessarily what you want. Need and want, very two very different things. I am a drummer by trade. I do get distracted by shiny new objects. And I have to sit back sometimes and go, wait a second, is that really the sound I need right now? Nope, I need this sound. Let's go get that. But in the beginning, I had we had whatever we had. We did the best job we could with that. And we it was kind of like ear training over the first you know few several years of it is you start because in the beginning you don't really hear everything how it's going to be you just you're just hearing what you hear right now and then you get down the road and you go oh man that one that sound doesn't really work or holy crap once I put a little compression on the drums those overheads are got really crispy and bad why is that oh it's those overheads had a bunch of 10k already in it and now that's reacting with the compression you know all that stuff you kind of learn as you do. But I remember that was one of my moments with overheads is when I started realizing that I was getting a good sound, but as my mixing got better and I started pushing things more, either being more aggressive, more creative with it, I noticed that I started to get a kind of a crunchy cymbal sound. And once I diagnosed the problem, it was like, okay, wait a second. With what the things I'm doing, the things I'm hearing in my head at mixing, the overheads that I'm using are not reacting well. They're not doing a good job down the line in the state, in the mixing stage. So I went, okay time to go on a search for some overheads and we went through i mean geez how many over the <laughs> now i've kind of settled on the the few that i use quite a bit but part of that is learning to listen for what isn't working and figure out what that is so you can go get something that does work right correct and this ties in perfectly to the question they say here uh some engineers say small condensers for quick response on overheads and so this ties in perfectly because of what we're going to show today, which is we took. Yeah, we actually, right before the broadcast, we did a last minute, just really fast drum recording. We took the song from that the T25 video and I just played some drums. We put three different, entirely different type of overheads, but we at least have some musical context with the point being how each type of mic makes the, the drums feel on their own in the mix and also kind of you know the texture of things and ultimately kind of mostly how you feel different as you listen to the the different ones and we'll listen to that in a little bit now rr you're not wrong on that i mean that is something that you know small diaphragms usually they're faster better transient response that's why i like the mini k47 it's kind of that middle ground of the transient response but uh large diaphragm roundness which is kind of cool and fullness and all that stuff yeah, yeah. But then, then that see that depends too. Then you got here's the rabbit hole with all this, and I'm gonna talk from my perspective first, which is the work we do here is a lot of different work. I have a fairly large mic locker. You know, any two sessions can be completely different or will be completely different. So I may have, I actually don't have a pair of small diaphragms anymore. That I well, no, I do. I have a pair of Audio Technicas that work pretty good. The uh, uh, 450s, but they end up on hi hats because they rock. But so I may have one session where they want things dark, full, round, not hi-fi. We may have a, ribbons up on the overheads. I may even have a pair of ribbons in the room as well. Then we may, the next day, it may be metal where it's like, okay, there's everything's got to be as hi-fi and as clear as possible because, you know, drummer's trying to play a thousand freaking mm -hmm. miles an hour and all, everything's going. We need clarity and a ribbon doesn't give you that. 
So I may have, that's why I have a lot of different mics. For a lot of people at home, maybe you don't have, you know, 40, 50, 60 mics in your mic locker and you have a set to work with, which is cool too because you can really get to know them. And as you go on, you can really learn what they do, what they don't do. So what they don't do, you go, okay, you know what? I've been working, you know, sometimes I work this way and I really wish I had, you know, I have sound A, which is my small diaphragm fast, but I need something that's a little bit rounder, maybe gushier sounding to augment that sometimes on some sessions that maybe my overheads can actually be more of the overall drum sound. So then that's your next thing. You, you have your small diaphragm, you go find a large diaphragm that gives you that the sound that you like. And I'm not even, I don't even want to get in the whole mic company thing, all that stuff. This really isn't about that. You know, I have what I have, you have what you have. And then we're all probably going to spend way too much money over the coming years buying more and more and more. But it's more about just thinking of it as a texture, as a color, as depth, that sort of thing, and identifying that. Because I know we're all going to keep buying gear. I don't need any more gear here. I mean, logically, I don't. Who's logical? I'm going to buy lots more. There's a lot of microphones I still want to try. There's a lot of other gear, and I know I'm going to try different types. There's some ribbons I want to try uh, and see how they react with the sound especially for drums, getting adding depth in the sound. You know, one thing we realized with the EGH thing was those Red 12 shotgun mics are, shotgun shell mics are so bitchin' for ambience. They have such a color to them that they add instant depth because even if you have it loud, it will never feel like the room comes forward with those. You can always set it behind whatever source you have. Hmm. Maybe let's, let's show them. Maybe some people don't even know those mics exist, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Go ahead and yeah, pull that up right there. What was the company? Uh, the first one I said was Red, the Red Twelve from Twelve Gauge Microphones. That is one of our Microphone Monday uh, video mics. Actually, we had on there. I've been real impressed with those. But one thing I liked about them—that's actually a good mic to talk about—is it was the first day I got that. It showed up in the middle of a session. We were doing drums for an um, artist named Sullivan Marsters, who his EP is coming out, just released a single last month, is releasing another one this month. He played everything on there. So he was in doing drums, and FedEx showed up. So I said, hey, do you mind? I'm just going to throw this mic up. We won't spend any time on it. I just you know, want to hear it. Stuck it on a mic stand, threw it in the middle of the room where my all my the 4080s were and my other mono mic. Forgot about it for a while, went about our business recording the rest of the songs for the day. Got to the end. I go, oh, man, what, what does this mic sound like? I pulled that up. Oh, here. Let me there get this. this mic in particular. And it's not a shell. It's an actual mic. <laughs> so you're in camera trace, right? Yeah. So, yeah, these guys. Yeah, they're Omni. They're cheap. He builds to order, I believe. But the thing I really loved about this mic is it sounded a little gritty. It was not hi-fi, and it is Omni, which also makes it really smooth on top. The way it handled the cymbals and the way it made the kit sound large and deep, it picked up plenty of room, but it somehow made the room sound fatter than, <laughs> than normal, which was really cool. And instantly I pulled that thing up, and I had this depth back behind the drum set, you know, which was really cool even if I was loud, and it handled compression well. First thing I did, Sullivan and I listened to it. Even he went, holy crap, what is that mic? Loved it. Every session after that, he goes, you got the shotgun shell mic up, right? I ordered <laughs> another one before we went even to record the next song. Got right back on and ordered a second one and used it as stereo rooms a lot, and it works great. That's just one example. The 4080 Audio Technica also, it's a ribbon that you don't think of. It's small. It's easy to place. It's very smooth, and it does a great job with ambience as well. Especially on the way it uh, reacted with the guitars was really freaking mm -hmm. nice. Favorite budget microphone? Oh, that's Crap. Jesus. Yeah, Can you give me a use budget microphone for what? Narrow it down for me. Because I mean, all things considered, I would say that a lot of the stuff that we have we're using all the time. Except there is a U87 that you've got we use. We do have the Calaris, the Delphos. But there's not too many ridiculously expensive mics. And that's another thing, too. When you're choosing, there's so many variables, especially when you're starting out. It's like you're just trying to build things. That's why I want you to think about what you want your songs to sound like. What kind of music are you doing? Whether it's your solo, whether you're with the band, 
really try to think about that. You can change things as they go, but if you start trying to plan that and think about it more, the type of sound you like, how do I get the sound I hear in my head and really think about that and try to articulate, that will drive your decisions on what you should get next to try to get that sound. Yes, there's all sorts of manipulation stuff you can do in the box after the fact. I'm not a huge fan of that being the solution. Sometimes it is, but I like that to be a last resort personally. No matter what, whether it's a vocal, whether it's a guitar, or maybe you're creating effect, that's a whole other thing. Go to town. But if I'm having to do a lot of work in the box after that just to make the thing sound the way I should have recorded it in the first place, no matter what the source, then I did a really crappy job on the recording side, or I didn't have the things I needed to get that sound. I know you hear this cliche thrown out all the time. It's you know not the gear, it's the ears, and that is true to a point. But we don't record one note of anything without gear. I don't care if it's a plug-in, mm-hmm. I don't care if it's a console, I don't care if it's a Focusrite Scarlet, a Pile microphone, I don't care. Everything is gear. And part of that sound that we get with our ears and want to do, we pick the right tool. It's just like a carpenter, man. If I need to unscrew something from my cabinet, I'm not going to use a hammer. Yeah. Unless I was pissed off. <laughs> well, and, then I'd use a hammer. In the beginning, uh, when we didn't know besides the big brands, right? We we went with MXL because that was our first option to just get budget stuff, you know? And then from that point on, we started comparing. So, okay, that's why this and that's why that, you know? So, But, but the thing is, we did do a lot of comparing. And we, I mean, especially in the old studio, oh my Lord, how many nights did, did we do mm-hmm. just recording tidbits of drums and guitar and just listening back and changing and listening and changing and listening and moving and listening and changing, you know, just over and over to hear how the mics that we did had reacted. And some of those MXLs were great. I mean, we did do a lot of good recording because eventually you use your gear and you learn how to get around its shortcomings. Then you hit a point where the short, you don't want to get around the shortcomings anymore. You want to, you, you don't want your starting point to be here and you get around the shortcomings. So your starting point is here. You want your starting point to be here, so everything you do makes it here and that much better. You really learn that by just using what you have, what you like, what you don't like, or make notes of each of those things, and then go, okay, I don't like that with that mic, and I'm doing a lot of that. I need to go find the mic that's going to help me record that, whatever that is, being vocals, guitar, Mm -hmm. whatever it is. Here's a good question. Is there a difference between the Roswell and the mic parts mic? Yes, there actually is. Um, That would have been a great question for Matt, and I think I'll have to ask him what that is. I know they are not the same. He, I, I think he uses some of that as the R and D for what eventually becomes a Roswell mic, but they are very picky on the mics they release for Roswell. So there's a purpose behind all of them, and that is part of Matt's version of building a mic locker. Which, if you haven't seen the video we did with him with the the mic parts, go back and check out that live stream on the front page of the YouTube channel. I now have a, a live stream replay playlist. He goes through somewhere in that his whole um, concept of building a mic locker, which is what informs his decisions on the mics that he builds for Roswell. And that's another thing that since then, when Ernesto and I have been talking about this because that was what Matt says is such a great point is you don't want to buy multiples of the same thing. A lot of the more inexpensive mics are that, you know, where you, they have, they might have different models, but you go start looking at the specs, you get them, you listen, you realize they're really just two flavors of the same thing, which, you know, if if you have, if you want, you're doing five toms on a drum set, maybe you want five of the same, get it there, get something good for that. You know, you want matched overheads, that sort of thing. I totally understand that. But most of the time, that's a specific use. Most of the time, as I'm picking mics, you're trying to look for things that complement each other that adds to the sound that you already have, not more of the same sound. Uh, I think I, how do I pick mic for a vocalist? That's a fantastic question. And we just did this with Nicole Carson, actually, a friend of mine that was in recording last week. We did some vocals. She's got a video coming out on Monday. They did a cover of a cover. It's hilarious. She's a badass singer. The whole band recorded it. It was a quarantine video, so everybody did their own thing at their the house. I got the I had the pleasure of recording her vocals and mixing it. That's coming out Monday. But what I hadn't recorded her in a long time, so what I did is her and I talked a little bit about 
what she wanted what kind of sound do you want you know i knew what the song was it was kind of a punk tune she wanted something clear kind of in your face it's like okay so i took five of the bikes that i thought would get us in that ballpark and i set them up we did when we recorded like a verse and a chorus on each of those microphones and then we listened back i asked her what she liked you know in her headphones how it felt and then we listened back in the control room to which one not only sounded great with her voice that we thought, oh, that's complimenting your voice, but it fits perfect in the so- the song. What ended up winning was the Roswell Pro Audio Delphos. For that song, it was the most crystal clear, open, and forward without being aggressive. And then I was hitting it with the, I don't know if you can see behind me, the Day King back here, on the way in. And a little bit of the Rupert Neve 542, just to taste. And the, the other mics we tried out were the Claris. The AT4047, I can't remember the fourth. I was going to set up an SM7B because I know it was a power thing, but the second, we did the Delphos first, and when I heard that, I knew it was going to be one of the condensers. It would not end up being the dynamic, so we didn't even put that one up. But the other ones, the AT sounded good. The Kolaris sounded really good. The Kolaris sounded very vintage. It was really round, but it didn't come as forward as I thought it was going to. And then I turned the pad on on the Kolaris, which is cool because it changes the way the mic functions. Not only is it a 10 dB pad, but it takes some of that coloration away and it makes it a little clearer. That's what we ended up using on the background vocals. But none of those mics came close to bringing her voice clear and open and forward as the Delphos. So I, all, I, I, I look at it two things. One, I'm trying to match, get something good for the vocalist, and I'm trying to get something good for the song. And I'm trying to hopefully win on both of those accounts. So I, don't, I, I know some people... And myself included, sometimes you know. Every, the, I think mics with vocalists is really obvious. Where on a drum set, you know, overheads they might be more subtle differences. You put it up with vocals, oh my lord, you hear it right away what the differences are. And sometimes you find the perfect mic for the vocals, and that's what you always use. But sometimes you have maybe the perfect condenser. If I was using that Roswell, and we were doing a gritty like White Stripes kind of tune, that would be I would have <laughs> gone a very different direction with the microphone choice then, because it's not just the vocalist sound. It's the song sound. Well, uh, finally, we have the answer. All-purpose budget microphone. I mean, that's not easy. Man, you made your general question more general. <laughs> okay. Okay. What's the budget? At least give me that. Give me a number to work around, and I'll, I'll tell you the things I've used in that area. What other questions? Okay, we yeah, we, we got plenty. I have a bunch of really good mics from mic parts. I'm still struggling, struggling getting a good drum sound in my home studio. Should I focus more on my room or spend money on, on room. a preamp? Room, room, yeah. room, room, room. In case you, uh, you didn't understand that room, I mean, that is the sp- drum. Let's put it this way. Any instrument that relies on the room for its sound, the room should be the first thing you do. A preamp, I know the preamp is the more fun thing to buy, it will not fix your room problems. Deal with room. And we do have something coming up. I got to get back to Matt Phillips, who joined us not mm-hmm. too long ago. Sorry, I'm like, I'm Dwight right now on uh, <laughs> office when he's doing his speech. Uh, uh, Matt Phillips is going to be joining us again on some acoustic stuff. We're just scheduling it, going through some ideas. Probably, I'll, I'll have an answer in the next week when he's going to join us. We're really going to talk about the acoustics in the room thing. I'm seeing myself come up doing... <laughs> <laughs> What am I, Italian? It's not right. I'm Russian and German. So, but yes, the room first. That that's got to be it. Couple questions there. What's your room size? What's the treatment you have in there now? How tall are your ceilings? Yeah, that would be that. Yeah, got the who's got the a, the mini K eighty sevens? Kobo Video. Got nice. The- I love that microphone. Absolutely love yeah. it. Yeah, has a pair and. And he likes the video because uh, uh, the video you did. Ah, yeah, nice. I'm glad we could be of service. Yeah. Um, then, what's um, favorite overhead mics for drums and why? I'm gonna start. I'm gonna go on since we are talking Roswell. I'm gonna go Mini K A 47. Is one that gets used for me a lot. Why? To go back on a point we had earlier, talking about small diaphragms being having a faster response, a better transient response. For me, the Mini K47 for a large diaphragm does a fantastic job of capturing the transient. It is almost small diaphragm-ish, which is kind of cool, yet it has a 
thickness and kind of a roundness of the large diaphragm. It is open on the top without being harsh. And that is a problem I have with a lot of the more the more inexpensive or cheap overhead mics is a lot of them are pushing 10K. I mean, how many times we look at graphs and go, oh, my God. And I don't need more 10K in my cymbal, especially my freaking hi-hat. And if I want, and if I need it, I want to add it. I don't want the mic making that choice. The Mini K forty seven doesn't have that. I almost never end up EQing high end into my overheads now. And even when I'm mixing, if it's especially if it's something I recorded and that the forty seven was the microphone, I almost never add high end on that because I don't need to. There, it's just there and it's articulate. That gets used a lot for me now. If I'm was this a budget microphones that he asked, or is this yeah, in general? Um, yeah, the budget. He actually told uh, told us the price. No, but the oh. overhead question was that also budget? Uh, I'm no, 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 on a tangent. no, no. I forgot to say. No, no okay, no. good. Um, I also really like the if I want something just uber uber natural, like just to capture what everything sounds like right there and be transparent. Audio Technica forty fifty. It do, It's I, I think it's one of the mics that does the best job of being invisible as you're recording. So if you have a great sounding source and you don't want to alter that going through your signal chain, the 4050 is great. Plus it is a multi-pattern mic. So you get a lot for your money. It's also not that expensive. I want to say 599 or 450 in that area. You probably find them used uh, good prices right now. Let's see. What else have I used that I really do? Uh, AT4047. I haven't used them on overheads in a while, but that one for a a long time I did use quite a bit and loved it. On the budget side of that overhead, a mic that I had a lot of good luck with, and I'll see if you agree or even remember when we used these, but was the MXL V67G. It's one of the green ones, and I do like the green MXLs. I think that series of mics way outperforms the price tag on there. And actually, I still have a friend that uses those that uh, got them because we used them on a session yeah. here many years ago. I'm trying to think what else I've used that I like. If I'm going ribbons, well, I'd go my Audio Technica 4080s, but I only have one pair, and it's one of my favorite room sounds, so they almost never come off the room. But we, I have the Fathead 2, but Scott who did all the full-on drums with me. We did a bunch of Cascade stuff years ago, so they gave us a bunch of uh, mics for it. He has the, he got the pair of the regular fat heads, so if I needed just that, I'd probably go borrow those from him because I, I like the fat head ribbon. It's smooth but not too dark. I have a pair of MXL 144s, which for a $99 ribbon mic, I actually dig it, especially on guitar, but it is, to me, in every sense of the word, a true old-school ribbon mic. It is dark, where the fat head, to me, is just not quite as dark. And they're also fairly inexpensive. I know there's another pair. I just can't uh, something different. I just can't think of it off the top of my head. Well, I know that uh, there's a very, I wouldn't say cheap, but very affordable AKG. Is the Perception P220. We both. I remember listening to that. We both thought that sounded pretty good, actually. Yeah. So that's. I think that one is like 199 or whatever. It's you know it's a very affordable mic. Uh, I know Ralph. Uh, uses those because I, I brought him a pair of those and yeah he uses them for overheads and AKG so there you go um, okay budget for I hope that answered the overhead question because I don't think I said why on each of those yeah. mics but I'll get back to it if I didn't answer it just yell at me in the comments and I'll answer it or or donate so we so we can uh, answer quicker yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else am I the budget there? is four in the box for the all purpose Okay. Hmm. All right, I'm going to go one good mic that would be under that would be the Audio Technica 4040, which is the basically a cardioid version of the 4050, although the the graph is a little bit different. But that is a fantastic mic for and I think it's less than 400. Right now Mike Nealon borrowed them after we did the drum session. He always borrows the 4040s for me when he needs them. Hey man, can I use your 4040s again? That's a good one. I'm going to go with both the Roswells, the Mini K47, Mini K87. I think they're right at 400. And they're two very different sounding mics, which is nice. One is the 47 more forward, more articulate, not as spread out. The 87 is rounder, smoother, uh, a little fatter in the low mid. That Perception mic that we talked about, is that one that's in that you had brought over mm -hmm. in there? Is that what it is? Mm -hmm. You want to grab that? Uh, oh, here. You don't know where it is. 
here. No, but I mean, I can pull it up on on on, on the website. I can okay, see. yeah. Um, because that's oh, actually a pretty good one. Before I forget, from Italy, they're saying hi. Daniel uh, is gonna get the Trident in ten days. Dude, you're getting it in ten days. You gotta send photos, man. Get on the the Facebook group. There's a link in the description and show photos. I cannot wait to see. I checked out your studio. You've got some cool stuff in there. I cannot wait to see that Trident in there. That's freaking awesome. Brother. I saw someone mention the 40 right here. 4040. The 4033. I don't have those, but I actually just mixed something for someone that used those on overheads, and they actually sounded pretty good. It's a little bright for me. I would prefer um, the 4051, which is a small diaphragm, I guess, in the family of the 4050. But again, they're, it's a very colorless, smooth mic, and the high end is nice on them. Oh, another budget one for overheads that I had a lot of good luck with for a while was the, I'm going back to MXL, the V67N, also the green ones. The pattern is a little bit wide on them, so it's a tiny bit unfocused, but I always uh, was very happy with how my drum sounded just in the overheads. Oh, here, let me pull that up. Yeah, so so this is the old uh, per AKG Perception, uh, which came in in... And this weird silver, and now the AKG sells this one just in black. It's just the same thing, but you know it has a a, um, a high pass and and a pad, so it's great. I I use it in in the in school for acoustics, vocals, and Jesus, for 199 or whatever the price. Can't complain. Yeah, I mean the stuff that we I mean we spent a whole night just listening to different things, and I remember going, oh my god, that's not bad for a cheap microphone. And then Billy uh, says he likes his 4040s for overheads. Yeah, they're great for that, man. And then the 4080s are there the ribbons? Yeah, the 4080s the ribbon. Yeah. What was was there a 4080 question in there yeah, somewhere? Yeah, if, if they're better than the 4080s. <laughs> if which is what's better than the 4080? Uh, that that's the other question, yeah. Oh. What so okay, so who said e e, e paid e party? Don't know how to say that. Don't get mad at me. Are they better than the 4080? Is what better than the 4080? clarify that and i will answer to the best of my abilities oh billy got a pair of 4047 to me the 4047 is a desert island mic if that's the only mic you gave me i know i could record everything i want it can handle the spl i like the color because it's got the transformer in there in it uh i like the way it picks up symbols i like the way it handles compression it's got multiple patterns you can do a lot with it and on the, I think my parallel of the 4047 would be the Delphos for all the same reasons, except the Delphos would be a bit more open and grandiose sounding in the highs. I need to blow my screen up like yours. I'm sitting here. I've got this thing hooked up HDMI to the rig over there, and it makes the resolution so damn tiny. Wow, we got a great offer from from uh, Yeti. Uh, he wants to send us the SM81s to try them out, but... <laughs> He wants them back because he has them for 25 years. So, <laughs> man, if you want to do that, we'll we could totally do a video with that. I'll take care of them. That's a good microphone. It's been a long time since I've used. I you know I forget about some of the sure stuff sometimes because yeah. maybe it's just not as uh, exciting or whatever. But one of the actually that was the first vocal mic we used most of the time. What was that mic you got? The KSM uh, 27. Which one did you get? Was yeah. it the 27? Yeah. Uh -huh. That, for quite a few years in the beginning, was the by far the best mic we had, and it got used. <laughs> yeah, a lot. <laughs> Vocal, guitar, everything, you know. We use it everywhere we possibly could. All right. Oh, we got the the measurements for the room. Eight feet, a foot ceiling, eight sound panels with carpeted floor. Room is fifteen by twenty-five. Drum sounded huge. Mm. The eight-foot ceiling is that what it was? That's your biggest challenge right there. Yeah. For several reasons. One, it. I mean, you got fifteen by twenty foot. So yeah, you've got size there, but with that low ceiling, it's like just compression chamber. The other thing is. That ceiling's never going to be far enough away to not wreak havoc in some way on how your overhead sound in with the mix. And what I mean by that, and there's way there's ways around this, by the way. I'm just going to start with the you know dramatic side. 
it if you're let's see how can I do this so let's say this is the ceiling right this is the floor this is eight feet if your overheads are right here pointing down at the kit let's say they're a foot foot and a half away maybe you only have them at six feet so they're only two feet away so at two feet away it's a four foot round trip from you know reflection and that microphone's getting that from both sides it's picking up the direct sound coming up it's also getting the, the sound reflected off the wall back in one way is the diaphragm's going this way, and you've got sound coming back the opposite way with the diaphragm moving the opposite way. It might, it's uh, unlike two microphones, you would hear obvious phase. You flip one, you hear it. You hear it get better, hopefully. With one mic, you can't do that. Your enemy is time. And that is the time that the sound from the source hits the front of the mic and the time that the sound from the reflection comes back into the microphone. That is almost always thinning your sound out even if you don't realize it. What I would highly recommend there, because you got plenty of your depth and your width in that room is great. I mean, that's a, that's a good size room. Make your ceiling disappear and use absorption to do that. Just get anything up there that's going to kill that reflection from coming back down in your kit. It will change how your overheads hear the drums you'll get some fullness back and it may take a little time to learn how to hear that but once you start once you do start hearing it you're gonna be like holy crap your imaging is also going to get better because when you have that ceiling right there and your hi-hats you're playing your drums i mean that's just all bouncing back you're getting a washy left to right if you're using a coincident pair you're really getting no stereo image or very very little so just make your ceiling disappear do that first. Don't do anything else in the room. Just get some stuff above those microphones and make it disappear. I'm actually going to be doing something coming up with a friend of mine, uh, Ricky Ficarelli, who's a fun drummer, man. He's got a great YouTube channel, and he just uh, hooked up with SE Microphones, and he's doing some recording. I'm going to mix it. And he's in the same boat doing it at home. He just moved to Nashville from L.A., and he's doing that same thing, kind of dealing with uh, – his sound not quite being where it won. That's the first thing we did when I was talking to him the other day is just get some stuff on that ceiling and doing some testing right now. But that's the big thing. Otherwise, you're 15 and 25. That's pretty good. Here's another good question. Uh, tube mic going into tube pre. Too much? That's I don't know. I mean, It probably depends on what you want to hear. Probably for vocals, for example. Well, it depends on the vocalist. Yeah. I mean, if you're doing Aretha Franklin, that might be a little much, but you figure some of that old school stuff, that was that. They had tube mics going into those old tube consoles. That was the sound, you know? Mm -hmm. It it all de it comes down to too much of a good, is too much of a good thing too much? Yeah. <laughs> really? I know that's a terrible answer. And I, I mean, that, that, a lot of this stuff too, guys depends on taste and all our taste is going to be slightly different all our perception of sound is going to be slightly different that's why i'm just trying to you know give an overall general thing on things that we can think about because every one of us is going to have a different idea on what's too much or what's too bright or what's too dark or hey this sound should sound that way or you should use this drum head or you should use these guitar you know all that stuff so if you have a tube mic going into a tube pre and you love the way that sounds, freaking use it, man. You'll have something that's different than everybody else. I say try. If, if it was me, I'd try it. But I like to go. <laughs> I like things like, hey, is this too much? Good. I'm going to do it. <laughs> have, have we ever tried SE microphones? No. But I. that's what I'm getting ready to When I just mentioned with uh, Ricky Ficarelli. He's just got hooked up with them. Actually, when he moved to Nashville, Sweetwater helped him put his studio together. There you go. And now SE got on board, and I'm going to do a little mixing for him. So I can't, I'm kind of I'm eager to hear how their, their drum mics sound. And that'll be my first experience with those mics, actually, is be the mixing for him. Yeah, so Edwin says, yeah, my cymbal sound is so hard to tame. I will try to put up some sound panels. Yeah, what Rigo Beagle says, you see what he says. Here, scroll up just a hair. It's easier to look at your computer all the way there than his mine in front here. <laughs> uh, I would just you get anything you can up there. If you can, I agree with the, the four inches and a little space, but if you only have an eight-foot ceiling, you don't have a lot of space to give. So even if you have to put it directly on the ceiling, you're fine because you're not trying to broadband necessarily do broadband absorption. You need to kill reflections. Even if you had two inches of uh, Owens Corning, or any, I mean, anything. If you've got foam, whatever, just get something up there. If you can give up a little space, like you get four inches thick uh, cloud and can put it two or four inches away, great. 
but you're only an eight foot ceiling and already giving up, you know, three quarters of a foot can be kind of a lot. At the very least, just kill the reflection. All right, shall, shall we show? Um, yeah, what we, what we did. Okay, so this goes back to our topic of just <sighs> picking mics and identifying what you uh, are missing in your recording, what you want to hear, that sort of thing. So what we did is we just laid some drums down, and I used three different overheads. This is not about the mics. I'll tell you in a second which ones we used, but this is more about the texture they create and the effect they have on not only the drum sound, but the effect they have on the overall mix. Because these are all things I do my best to consider every single time I go to do a recording with someone, whether I'm going to be the one mixing or not. I'm like, okay, going down the line, based on what the artist has told me, is this going to be a problem for the mix engineer? So we should have, you should be able to turn the key on. And then here, turn the key on. Oh, the key? This guy? Yeah. What? Hold on a sec. I'm going to a little P&P &P going here. <laughs> there we go. All right. Ah, uh, that's the one, yeah. It's a little tricky. <laughs> and then on it's this kind of hidden over there on the switch. This guy, is it the second one? No, we're already on. Oh, we are on. Yeah, yeah, we're good. We're that. good. I'm going to make sure we can see everything. So here's what we have. I put up, we had a kick mic. We actually had the ATM 250 plus the Roswell Mini K47 KD. Just for the kick sound, I had the SDC84 mic parts for the snare. And that was it on the main kit just to, to fill in the bottom. In the main stuff, then we have a 451 AKG 451B small diaphragm on the top. A Roswell Pro Mini K47, and a Cascade Fathead 2. And I chose these mics because they all sound drastically different. I'm going to say before I play any of this, I, don't, I am not interested whatsoever in what sounds best as a microphone or anything or what we consider good. I'm more interested in interesting and what sounds interesting and fits whatever given track and whatever emotion I have, however I feel that day. So this is literally... What we were trying to do when we recorded this is just show how the different mics affect the sound. So maybe that, you know, some of you probably already have nice mic lockers. Some of you are just building them. But this hopefully starts you thinking about, okay, ooh, I need to I think about my sound. I, when I've been doing these recordings, I'm not getting this. So I want to go get a mic that gets that. All right? So that's the whole preface. So first off, I'm not going to – well, you're going to see. I was going to say I'm not going to tell you what, which one I'm turning on, but you can <laughs> see everything already. I'm going to start with the, the 451. Maybe, maybe kill the overhead so they know what. No, no, no. I mean, I'm oh, going to no? play this all oh, okay. in context first. Continue from there. Okay, so that's the 451. Now let's hear what the, the Mini K sounds like. Now, so we're going from our small diaphragm, and I'll solo this stuff up in a minute. I just want you to think in context before we get to this solo crap. Now the fat head is the overhead.
So as you can hear, all very different vibes in the drum set. And each time I change the mic, it takes my, my ears about four bars to settle in and not go, oh, that's a very different sound than what I just listened to. But they all handle the transient different because you can hear that for, if you go if, from both the condensers to the ribbon, it's an entirely different transient because the majority of the drum sound is coming from the overhead because it's just a mono overhead. The difference between the small diaphragm and the mini K, the large diaphragm is quite stark too. Not only the way it handles the transient, but the way it handles the high end. Now, ev now I don't want to turn this into a, a mic comparison of these three per se. It's just a representation of what three different types of mics will sound like because not all large diaphragms sound the same, not all small diaphragms sound the same, and not all ribbons sound the same. This is just thought-provoking. Okay? All right, so now let's see what they sound like in solo. This is the 451, obviously. I'm going to shorten this first part a couple bars so we won't. It's the same groove for a while. Oh. I'll do it right. And remember, this is just one overhead. Is yes, it? just mono. No stereo. No stereo here. Just to hear the difference easier. Here's the large diaphragm. Obviously, fatter. I would say is fairly typical of a large diaphragm as a generalization. And the ribbon. So that is the individual mics. I'm going to turn off the track. Let's mute that stuff. Oh, not record. Mute. And let's just hear. I'll play a few bars of each. Just this is with the kick and snare in. Kick is huge. Here's with the mini K. ribbon. And I tried to match the volumes as best I could between them, but even the ribbon, it's just so dark that even louder, it just doesn't sound as in your face as the other mics do. Now, a couple things that you could think about, and this is what we did with the guitars, is uh, for the, the Circus Tuesday, you can go watch that video later, went up yesterday, is we picked different mics for different sections. Or, or on the guitar sound, we had a our forward mic, our backwards mic, right? So what if, for instance, let's say on this one, let me zoom in here so I can cut easy. Let's say we wanted to go the first eight bars. Oh, let me see here. Let me count. We want it to be kind of thick and fat before anything, you know, gets a little bit crazy. So I'm going to go. We are going to mute you. We're going to mute you. We're going to do a cut. And these are some just ways you can treat, as you get to know your mics, that you can use them differently as the mix goes on. This is why I always have three or four pair of room mics set up on all my uh, recordings because I use that stuff as, you know, space, character, whatever in the mix. And let's say we want to brighten things up a little bit for four bars. 
And then I want to make things, I want to get to the biggest sound possible. Based on the mics that I have here. So now I'm going to go back to context because context is everything. Otherwise, if it, you don't have context, you're just recording in a vacuum, which is a great way to practice. But Okay, so now let's hear what this sounds like, and you're going to see. I'll blow it up a little bit. I've chosen different mics and overheads, and we'll, let's see how it just affects the tone. Here, it's like building as it goes up. It starts thick and dark. I love the Midnight Oil reference. I didn't even think of that song when we were doing this. I was thinking the old Spy Hunter video game. Mm -hmm. And th th that song came about. We were just doing that T25 video. I'm like, Man, we need something new to record. I want it short, whatever. And he starts playing this bass line. I go, boom, that's it. But it's totally Midnight Oil. That song is awesome. The horn stabs. If it's We're all thinking the same song, that is. So anyway, there's... There's a way that you can use microphones as your EQ, as your tone, because you hear it go from the ribbon to that 451. Yeah, I'm going to turn the ribbon up just a hair more. It's hard to get that one to feel as... You'll never get a ribbon to feel as forward as a condenser. You instantly hear, bam, it comes up. And then we go to the large diaphragm. And now you almost hear the sound get wider because in theory it is getting thicker, which makes it feel like it's got more girth on it. Do this with guitars. I do this with, uh, even back to the vocal mic question earlier, I do this even with vocal mics sometimes where we'll use different ones for different sections of the song to get a particular vibe or sound or character that we're looking for. Now, we, put, we pick drums to do this with because we felt it would be the easiest thing just to show the differences. This is really just a concept. I want to make that clear. I'm not pushing any of these mics per se, although they're all great, in my opinion, for their, what they do. But it's more about the, the concept of picking your microphones to get the desired sound and thinking down downhill, so all the way to where you get to the mix stage, what you want things to be like because that will inform all your decisions on how you record things. I'm not a fan of putting decisions off, man. I hate choices. Don't give them to me. Let's make a choice now. Whatever makes us feel good, funny, mad, sad, happy, whatever the vibe is of the song, make a decision and move on. That gets easier the more you know your mics. Or if you're looking to buy more mics, just think about different colors. Because otherwise you get a lot of the same thing. Yeah, see, Edwin, Edwin says, I need a ribbon. I really liked what that did to the highs. Ah, yes. Smooth on the highs. I, I, I highly recommend the Cascade ribbons, by the way. They won't break the bank. The fat head's great. This one is in particular is a fat head too. Although the difference in tone isn't huge. I don't know what the difference is on the inside, though. I'd have to look. Maybe the ribbon's slightly different. But one thing, too, to think about high end with the ribbon where you, you get automatic high end out of most condensers. It'll be a little bit different. Like the if I go with the Roswell, the 87 versus the 47, the 87 is a way smoother high end than the 47. And that's not to say the 47 is harsh because it's not. I think I said that earlier. But uh, the 87 has a more vintage -y feel on the over on the high end. But a ribbon is always going to have a smoother high end. Now, if you take some EQ and you start pushing that high end, it will never feel like a condenser you will get a different type of high end. Well, here, let's just, we got a damn ribbon mic here. Let's see what happens when I do that. Hmm. And let's just use the, uh, we'll just use the plug Logic plug in here. I'm gonna loop it and we'll see what happens. I 
got a shelf all the way down to 5k here. Pushing 7 dB. Oh yeah. Now, that's actually pretty, I forget that fat, it's pretty bitchin' microphone. What if I did that? And this is again something to think about uh, when you're doing any, not only picking your mics, but mixing. A lot of the times we go to automatic things. You know, we saw, we read some other, you know, your favorite mix engineer does this. You know, maybe you watch a lot of Chris Lord Algae and he's pushing 87,000 decibels of 10K on the console. So we start doing that and you wonder, wow, well, it doesn't sound like his. Well, of course it won't. We got to think about that because if I'm going to go do this same exact thing right now, where is that? To the 451. Hmm. You sure you want to do this? <laughs> um, no, I am not actually. You know what? Let's here. I'm going to unmute that section. We'll do the same section, so yeah. this is a more more apples to apples. Let me get that out of the way for a sec. Pull you over. Okay, so just to remember what we did, here's the with the fat head again. No EQ. All right, so let's go to the full 50 Uno. I need to unmute it first. <laughs> little things. Imagine that. If you unmute it, you actually hear it. Okay, here we go. Now, granted, I'm at a 5K shelf pushing 7.5 yeah. dB because I was doing it to the ribbon. But that the point I think is valid here, I couldn't do that same type of thing with a condenser. So if I want to push high end but I don't want it to get sizzly, I'm probably not going to use a bright condenser. And that's one thing for me, the 451, I'm not a huge fan actually of how hi-hats sound in it. And it gets real when you start to push it a little bit. So I wouldn't be able to do that. But on a ribbon... You can push the crap out of it. Let me go back to that ribbon. Let's get drastic, as in drastic. I'm at 15K, or I'm sorry, 15 dB of a 5K shelf. Jesus. Let's, let this, let's hear this whole track with the ribbon, actually. With that much high end pushed. <laughs> 15 dB of a 5k shelf and I'm not uh, my ears aren't bleeding right now but yeah so that's something to consider not only can you just get that fat smooth thing with a ribbon but you can also push the high end to get a very different type of top end out of cymbals on your drums than you would out of a condenser will it ever be as articulate as a condenser no it's just you're not changing the fundamental way the mic has captured the transient but you are changing the way it does or what it does to things around the transient especially when you start boosting some drastic i mean that's crazy although if i ever use this on overheads again i probably will do that because it's pretty bitching oh ernesto's pulling up some of the the big ones well because was that we, a we was got, that a 44 i saw no because we, we got uh juan juan diaz he, he's uh down the street uh he's in san fernando and he is offering the um, dude that is a that is a great ribbon mic. So, you know, anytime. Then all right, we're going to make that happen. You know what? We need to do a ribbon type episode. We need to do, mm -hmm. all right, we're going to work on some ideas on that. I got to write that down. So, yeah. I have no paper. I'm going to write it down. I got no paper. But, yeah, I mean, he left us his email. So, did you copy it? Uh, yeah, copy that sucker down, man. Mm -hmm. we'll do. I love ribbon mics. I mean, that's, uh, I actually wish I had more. 
I, I have a few of the, the the fat head gets used. My favorite. I love the Audio Technica 4080s. I know you don't, when you think of ribbon mics, you don't really think of Audio Technica, but that mic is awesome. It's a an active ribbon, so it it has a bit more gain. It's also not as dark, but it still does that smooth rib ribbon thing, especially with the uh, the high end with transient still nice and full sounding. On the cheap side, the audio the MXL R144, I think. I have well, I only have two of them now. I blew one up on a kick drum trying some stuff. But I learned what I need to learn to use a ribbon on a kick and not blow it up. But that is a great sounding cheap ribbon mic. You cannot go wrong with the fat heads, uh, the cascade stuff, the fat head, the fat head two, they're all really nice. Another one I've heard but haven't really got to use much is the Golden Age. It's pretty bitchin', and you can't go wrong with any of the AEA stuff. If you can afford it, it's great. Uh, the Royer, the same way. The 121 is an awesome ribbon mic. I do have the X15 Cascade as well, which also sounds really, really nice. I totally dig that. And you can build depth that way. For me, if we're talking drums specific, since that's kind of where we're at there for a second, if I may go on another tangent... I'm I'm gonna I don't know why I'm asking but I'm I'm gonna do it anyway. Mm-hmm. For my drum sound, a lot of the times I, I look at the these setups kind of as zones. Let's say I'm a full rock setup, so I've got 16, 18 mics out there on a kit. That doesn't mean I'm gonna use all those mics at the same time, ever really. And it, they're not set up to be that way. I'm not trying to make every mic actually be in phase. They are set up to capture different elements other the of the room or of the kit that fit the music that or that particular song that we're recording or EP or album or whatever it is. So for instance, I may have, if I'm going ribbons on my overheads, I'm probably going to have more condensers in the rooms than I will ribbons. So I'm not picking up more of that dark, thick, smooth ribbon sound in the depth of the kit because I won't necessarily be creating more depth. It'll most likely get more money before it'll get deep. So I may have ribbon over. I may put the 4080s on the overheads, but then I only have I have Delphos and 4050s out in the room to pick up my depth, but not necessarily add a ton of too much high end cymbal sizzle. Or maybe that is where the cymbal is, sizzle is coming from is my rooms, but not the overheads. If I'm my normal or my I won't say normal, but a typical setup is with the Mini K 47s, whatever complement of close mics. Then in the rooms, my first pair of rooms is going to be my 4080s. In a Blum line, maybe eight, nine feet in front of the kit, give or take. I can't remember what it usually ends up being. I have my spots that I know in there. I should measure them just so I can know. I'll I'll, um, most likely right around them have a Red 12 Omni uh, from Mono. Unless I need some dark spread, then I'll put the Red 12s in stereo and spread them a little bit. But usually I use that in mono, and I treat it two different ways. I treat it uncompressed because it's really cool on its own. Then I will parallel that over to one of my dynamites and absolutely blow it up. Pun intended. And then I have two mono choices there that I can use at the same time. Now those mics, that mono and those 4080s can be used together. They are in phase on purpose. Then I'll have one of several things I'll have almost always I have a pair of Delphos up as my wide big rooms that are as far back as possible up about 10 feet in the air sometimes I'll turn them around face them away from the kit sometimes they're facing the kit just depends on the symbols and then I'll usually have some sort of utility rooms the wall mic 57 on a wall Uh, maybe it's going to be a large or a small diaphragm down on the floor something like that that I'm using for some sort of accent mic that I'm those I try to get in phase with a normal kit, but I'm usually not going to use them at the same time. I'm going to use some sort of combination of my mid rooms or my distant rooms, or I have my spot mics, you know, on the wall or the floor or whatever that add different characters. The same thing sometimes if I'm doing three overheads. Occasionally I'll get them to where they're all in phase so I can use them, and that's what it is. Unless it's a big wide kit, maybe I have to have three, then I'm definitely getting them in phase. But sometimes I'll put a pair of ribbons or a pair of condensers <laughs> I'm from Kansas English not my first language I'll put a pair of condensers up but I'll have a mono ribbon hanging up there as well most of the time I'm not worried about that playing nice with the others I'm I have it up there specifically because something in that song wants me to go mono and thick 
and then pull back to stereo and wide. It, it Maybe at the chorus, maybe the bridge is going to explode. I don't know. It depends on the song. But usually that's what those are there for. Uh, like I said, occasionally I will get it to where if I have a ribbon in there that's mono that I can blend in and use with the the, the condensers. But placement takes a while to get that quite right. It all depends. But I'm not looking to make everything at work at the same time. I'm looking at different zones, different depths. I have a ribbon. I have a condenser. I have dynamics, whatever I'm using to create different depth as the as the song goes on. And that's taken way too much time by myself in here experimenting with different things. But that's how I kind of got it to that concept of like the zones i do have a video where i kind of walk through that i put up a few months ago i probably find that drop a link in i I saw a couple questions we meet something there so here bob pile told me to try the pr30 on overheads but i found that a way to make it work why well it says it's so good on other drums obviously so they're always in use for me okay but what didn't work with them on overheads and I don't. I'm not trying to be a, a a dick. I'm actually. It's a. I just want to know what you're hearing, because I think I have an idea what you're going to say. Here's what I think of the 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 PR30. I love it. Obviously, it's on every drum recording I do. I love it on toms better than any other tom mic. The rejection is. I don't know how he does it. It's absolutely awesome. Hi at mic. They're great. It is smooth smooth ever so smooth and because that pattern is so focused if you just do here let's go back to i'm going to get out of logic here go back to our other shot there we go if if you use a pr30 on a hi-hat and do if that's the hi-hat right here and i literally just move an inch this way or an inch that way i have a different hi-hat sound it's crazy now for overheads that can be good and that can be problematic because if you're doing spaced pairs, it can leave a hole in the middle a little bit because it is so focused. If you're just trying to mic your cymbals, they're great for that. And I've seen a lot of live engineers do this too, and it makes sense because their reje- their pattern is tight and the rejection is good. So if you're on a stage, you can kind of pump your overheads. You get a smoother sound that's not going to be harsh. And, and most condensers on a stage are going to pick up an excess of bleed where that PR30 isn't going to pick up as much bleed. A few years ago, Scott and I did a video for Heil that is, we only used Heil mics on everything, the overheads, hi-hats, kick, snare, toms, the whole nine yards. Go to the Heil uh, YouTube channel and check that out because it's actually a pretty cool drum sound. I would not say that this might, well, heck, is this a freaking PR30 in front of me? <laughs> <laughs> I love the way they sound on voice. I would not say it is a typical overhead sound at all. So my guess is you're just not hearing what you're used to hearing or wanting to hear, and you probably won't with that mic. So you either use this thing, you know, if you're using it live, it's not only to pick up symbols of the kit because it is smooth sounding, but it's to help kill the rejection around, which it's very, very good at. I mean, the backside rejection on this mic is insane. Hey, how you doing, man? What's that sound like there? Compared to that, I mean, it's ridiculous. Now imagine if, you know, you're a singer and the drummer's on the other side of you. It does a really good job at it. I think Bob Heil makes great mics. Great guy, great company, actually. What else? (laughs) Well, that and uh, Audio Technica has you covered. (laughs) (laughs) I still... (laughs) I get that from people all the time, man. <laughs> hey, it's stuck. I'm happy with that. Uh, that those were fun to do. All those videos were fun to do. One working with the guys at Audio Technica, Gary and everybody, Chris. They're all fantastic people. But getting to use all their different mics and record as many different things as we did, from drums to guitar to ukulele to dobro to all the bassoon you know french horn to all that stuff it was just it was a that was a great education in and of itself for me i had fun doing that (laughs) oh they're asking about the cylindrical diffusers uh yeah the ones on the back wall they're eight feet tall four feet wide and i think we're about six inches deep is what we did those 
like and I used one by sixes or two by sixes on the top and bottom to create the the curve. And on the inside they're ribbed. Somewhere I have some photos. Let me see. Let me pull up my photos real quick. I have a photo of those guys. <laughs> the videos helped him when he first started down the rabbit hole. <laughs> Good. That, I'm, I'm happy to hear that, actually, because that's exactly why we did them. Let me see. When did I build those? Yeah, the, the, the whole choosing the mic is 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 crucial, especially if, if you have a chance to get some of the classics. Uh, un until recently, I didn't know how how the famous Unidyne 57 sounded because everybody was talking about it. I know Charlie used it in, in some videos, but never really paid I attention. I used to steal Scott's until he yeah. wouldn't let me take it anymore. <laughs> so, well, so, far, so far it was always, you know, 57 is a 57, and then, you know, that's what it is. But then I found one on Reverb and, and got it. And it's a Unidyne with some... History was part of Charlotte Studios in North Carolina, and it was like, wow! So apparently, some famous people recorded over there, and then uh, we tested it here, and I tested it on on a guitar speaker. So, oh my God, how close this is to a condenser! I was so amazed. So no wonder people like that old Unidyne, and that's probably the reason why you can find them for two hundred dollars instead of the. 90 bucks at Guitar Center or less. So that's that's it. You know, it's like you start finding out about what those old mics sounded like, and that's sometimes amazing. I'm going to add to that, though. But just because it's an old vintage mic doesn't mean it's good. No, of course. And also understanding why it is you are going. I know you were searching for a sp some specific sounds, which is why you got a 421, you got the Unidyne. Yep. All looking for something and you found it but just because it is an old vintage mic that everyone talks about is so great doesn't mean it's going to be great for you you know that's just my two cents well yeah of course but i mean sometimes having these mics just because they're so rare and they use them a lot okay why why did did they use them it's like well i think even jim morrison was using them uh, live on stage you can see all the doors concerts he was always holding a, a 57 when he was singing so maybe he broke some of those too <laughs> i'm trying to find this I, ha I have photos of when i built those diffusers so it'd be just the frames and before they went on so to make a point you know why certain mics and why other mics the other day, I made a comparison just to choose and say, okay, I'm going to mic up the EVH with the EVH 2x12. So I put the Unidyne in the same spot, which is right on the edge of the dust cone. And then I put the 421 also in the same spot. And then I compared them. And I liked the 421 better because it just had a different mid range. But it wasn't like because one was better than the other. It's like just I just chose one that I liked best for what I wanted it to do. That's it. So I always knew that 421 was used for a lot of things and I used it uh, in one session and was like, ooh, that's not not too bad. So that's why I got it because I, I liked what I heard. So that's, I think, the main motive you should have. You just liked what, what I heard, what you heard and not, oh, everybody has this one, so you should get it. It's like, well, try it first. But it's that and how it fits in a song. Because mm -hmm. I have heard and put up drum sounds before that I dug, thought it was, this is killer, love it. And then we got it in the track and went, oh, my God, this doesn't work mm -hmm. at all. I did that with Nick Adams one time. We got this great drum sound up, and then we recorded this track and went, holy crap, we went the wrong direction. <laughs> and redid the whole drum sound because what was great on its own didn't work whatsoever in context. That's why I always say context is everything. I mean everything, because even, and that's why I don't look at things as good and bad, because what you what we might call a bad mic actually is the right mic for a certain vibe, mm -hmm. you know, so they're just flavors. I have no idea what I do with these photos. 
I'm going to keep looking while we're on here, but if I don't find them, I will post them to the Facebook group. Link is in L description below. That that's the new Spanish he's trying to Dude, I got this Spanish. I got I'm a I'm a <laughs> monster with <laughs> the L description below. That's 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 Hey, it's right. It's the new that's going to be the new the, LA the description below. <laughs> yeah. The new LA Spanish. Just wait. It's the Ultimate Studios Inc. Spanish. <laughs> Wait to hear my Italian. <laughs> Man, what did I do with those photos? All right, I'll. I know I have some somewhere. I will post them in the Facebook group. Yeah. I mean, yeah, th this whole mic thing, you know, mic lock or whatever. You can also compare that to how many guitar pickups are out there. I mean, it's just ridiculous, you know. And a lot of them, you know, they they do their own thing. But so many, right? All these boutiques are trying to copy what? They copy the famous 59, you know, that came in those old Les Pauls. And, you know, they're all trying to copy that. And what is so so amazing about those old mics, or maybe not amazing, but unique, I would say, is they were, they were all wound by hand, right? So you got Bob just counting. You know, it's like one, two, three, four, and then his colleague hey bob what yeah what are you gonna do the weekend i don't know what you i don't know let's get a beer okay 21 22 23 24 <laughs> right so every mic came out different and you know so now when when you get my um uh, mic every um wound they did was you know not exact but now with all these machines you know every pickup is pretty much identical so I guess that was the appeal back then. Like every Les Paul sounded different, which still happens because you know you cannot make uh, an exact batch of wood because wood is whatever you get. But yeah, I mean that's that's the appeal. So on on guitar land, it's like geez, get get a get a Fender fanatic and a Gibson fanatic in the same room, you'll have conversation for the next two hours, you know, and it's you know it's it's endless, it's endless. I'm going to have to find these later, man. I have so many freaking photos in here. It's like, holy crap. I can't remember what year I built them. It wasn't right away, and I'm already back to October 2014, and I'm still seeing them there. Yeah, mics and guitar pedals. It's the same thing. I mean, Jesus. How many distortion pedals are out there? I mean, people tell me, hey, you know about this pedal? It's like, uh, no. Oh, these are great pedals. Okay, let me check it out. And sometimes you don't have time to check it all out. It's just so much. And in the end, you know, it's just distortion. But yeah, it's just, it's a pretty big rabbit hole. But that's what makes it fun. Oh, yeah. Because you can keep doing it. But yeah. at the end of the day, you still have to work and get something done. Because the whole point of any of this is to, you know, create something and then get it out to everyone. You know, so you can spend all your time just experimenting and never actually get any real work done. Which is why I don't like getting a lot of new gear all at once. Yeah. I like getting things in stages, so I have to try to f learn it, that piece of gear, how it fits the mm -hmm. workflow, all that sort of thing, f where it's good, where I don't like it, you know, for any given song, and then use it. And then later, get another piece. It, it's like having the right tools for, let's say, putting together a mic, right? Like soldering tips right now are you making fun of me not <laughs> having the right soldering tip for that <laughs> no just giving an example it's like if you That's need okay. to be you a, should make fun of me uh, a pcb you should have the right soldering tip for it because you're wondering when i built that microphone i the tip i had was too no good way to say this at <laughs> no all. no no you just had the wrong tool for it yes i mean you you <laughs> No one wants to admit their tip is too, too no, small. No, 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 no. But you finished the mic. The mic worked, but it would have made your your uh, work much easier and faster. Oh yeah, it would have made some of the desoldering joints that are you know a little iffy less iffy. Oh wait, am I striking gold here? No, no, not yet. Damn. I yeah. Gotta be close. Getting gear in stages. Yep. You want to start knowing the gear you have first you know very important found them guys holy crap this wow. is i built these in 2000 august 2013 i didn't think it was that long ago it feels like you know yesterday yeah. 
Wow. All right, I'm going to flip Almost over. seven years ago. <sighs> Yesterday seems so far away. Anyway, let's see. Yeah, here, I'll scoot this a little over. Okay, so this is the frame. This has nothing to do with microphones, but I don't care. This is the frame for those diffusers in the back. They're eight feet tall. We used, it, we basically used four by eight birch that's about a quarter inch thick. So it was pretty easy to bend it over and shape it. There you can see a little bit more down here, how the thickness. And then they're put together with black, actually drywall screws, and I got these silver eyelets. So as we, as I screwed them in going down, they've got a look to them with the little, the eyelets. Let's see if I have any other. Oh. I thought I had more photos of that. Oh, there we go. This is my vintage iPhone taking these photos. That's before the, the wood. Man, this, this photo's old. And then what I did on the inside, in between the ribs there, once we put the birch on the front, I have one inch of rigid fiberglass, some Owens Corning in between them. So reflection coming back off the wall is getting high-end stuff, at least, is getting slightly absorbed just to soften any of that reflection coming back into the kit up a little bit. And they work rather well. You can get really close to them, and it doesn't really alter the tone too much, you know, like with the skyline diffusers on the other wall, if you get within you know two feet, maybe even three feet of those, you really start to hear the tone change quite a bit, kind of get a little bit nasally. Those wood big poly diffusers or kind of poly diffusers don't do that at all. Oh man, some of these comments are the best, man. The building up some options is addictive, but if my wife knew how much all this gear costs, I'd be buried in the crawl space within a day. <laughs> I hope she doesn't jump on the broadcast and see this. <laughs> There's a, I know when, uh, when to be home first for the delivery, so I just tell her I'm going to sell old stuff to pay for it. She knows I'm full of it, but doesn't bother calling BS. <laughs> now that okay, that there's a partner right there. Uh, and then to Obsidian, I'm often threatened by my wife with divorce when I buy new gear. That's one of the main reasons I buy new gear. <laughs> Oh my lord. Oh, you guys are the oh. funniest. Oh, this That's is... good. I saw a question in there somewhere, Brian. Uh yeah, are you familiar with the old uh 65 Radio Shack PZM high impedance mics from the 60s or 70s? I have one of those in the back that I need to fix actually. They're pretty cool. They have a sound to them for sure. They're great for blowing things up or getting very unique sounds. Matter of fact, this would have been back in the old school or old studio. Scott and I, in one of the full on drums episode, one of our effects episodes, we took one and laid it on the floor. I was playing drums, laid it on the floor right next to the pedal under the snare. Super sensitive. I had to play so light to not completely just explode the sound. But oh my lord, the, the effect, fat, vibey drum sound we got was pretty cool. I need to fix that and use that. The crown ones are actually, I think, a little bit better, if I'm not mistaken. And the mic. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's always some whiz to uh, comes up with mods. It's just awesome. Brian, I would be highly interested in knowing more about that. If you have any info, please join the face group group where we can converse in between broadcasts and let me know. Because I, I need to fix mine. They're pretty pretty cool. I was actually going to mount one in the walls of the studio when we were building it and kind of forgot. Anything else we missed through there? Uh, no. I mean, we'll probably hear about some divorce filings <laughs> next week or two. <laughs> I got divorced 20 years ago now. Oh, 19 years ago. Oh, see, I saw your video a while back using the 44.7 on the crutch mic sound a killer how often do you use that in the mix oh was that it are you r and are you talking about the there's one video i have up that was only that mic but that is one of my favorite mics to hang over the kick and do that if i'm 
I haven't done that in a while, actually. I need to do that again. I almost, if it's there, I almost always use it a little bit in inside of a larger setup. If if you're going for vibe and you get the placement right, you can just get a cool drum sound on your on its own with that microphone. But you can compress the crap out of it. Cool thing about 4047 is it handles cymbals, excuse me, handles cymbals and compression well. So you can compress something and the cymbals don't get harsh with that microphone. So you can hang that thing over the kick drum and nail it with some compression. Just have it smacking hard. And you just tuck that thing in and your kick and snare instantly come forward. But in a very different way than if you were just EQing or compressing your normal kick or snare mics. Or even parallel compressing. It's a whole different vibe. But if you get the placement right in between the toms and everything, that one microphone there is a pretty cool sound. But then it's all on the player player got to be able to handle the balance oh any suggestions for a less bombastic modern mic for a kick i tend to use pr48 but it's definitely a thing yeah pr48's got some it's eq'd to be a kick mic man you know so it's it, it's it's sound I like the i use atm250 from audio technic a lot because it's easily shaped it's got a great mid-range in it. Um, if I want click, I have some MXL. Uh, what the heck were those called? Oh, the ass kicker, A55. A55. And it has, for metal, man, it's it's just like the 2 to 3K in that microphone is great. It's just there. I don't, You don't even have to dial it in. Sometimes you're actually notching it out a little bit. But it does a nice job with the bottom as well. I have a lot of luck with the ATM250, though. I've been able to go from an old school to a modern thing with that mic pretty well just by being careful with the mic placement a little bit and then a little bit of EQ here and there. Then uh, decide on a good ribbon. I like the 121, but too much money. So any... Cascade, Fathead. I love the 121. That's a fantastic ribbon mic. Actually, those guys are only not too far from here. Mm. And uh, Dusty and them are good friends of mine. we got to get them over here, do something mm -hmm. with them. Because uh, the, all the Royer stuff is fantastic. But if it's too much money, look at the Cascade. They make great. The The fat head is a fantastic ribbon mic. It really is. I'm trying to think what else sounds like that. I mean, if the, four, if the 121 series, the 4080s are also fairly pricey. The, I wouldn't say the MXL, if, if that's the kind of tone you're going for, the 144 is super cheap and not going to be that sound at all. It's going to be really dark and thick. Wow. Look at that. Tire sound guy. I've been loving the silo stuff. ADB is so cool. Ah, nice. Let those guys know that, by the way. And Matt is going to be coming on and talking acoustics with us in a few weeks. We're just trying to nail down a date right now. They will be very happy to hear that. I keep – it's so funny. I, I have the whole thing in front of me, and I just – I look at your computer because it's easier to read. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I just zoom zoom in. That's I know. What I, do. I know. It's Royer Sale Month, They got apparently. some on sale. Say what, Sinead? What? An, oh, ARTA5 ribbon? What? You got to look that up. Look okay. that thing up. What Hold the hell? Oh, check out the Cascade. Uh, I said Cascade already. Check out the Golden Age stuff, too. I don't have a Golden Age ribbon. I have a good friend that has one and loves it to death, and I have heard so many demos with it because I keep meaning to get one, and for whatever reason, I haven't. But I like what I've heard enough to where I am going to get one. What? But this ART mic I've never heard of. Active ribbon mic. Look at this. Oh, well. You I'm going to make a phone call. Yeah. What the heck? I like ART stuff. Oh, yeah. There, I said it. I've always had good luck with it. Okay. The, it they always has a vibe. And I've that used down. a lot of it over the years. Yeah, right. write that down. So anytime they make something, I'm always interested in trying out because I think they're one of the better companies making inexpensive stuff that actually has a vibe and does something cool that works. So we will definitely check that out. Active Man. Ribbon mic. See? Learning something new. Love it. Wow. Yeah, just just so much out there. It's awesome. How do I think? Wait, I just missed a question. Roy, your R, R10 is on sale. Mm. That mic actually looks cool. I think, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, everything taken, that is their 
I'm going to use this term usually their budget version, kind of not not necessarily their version of the 121, but it's their their more budget Royer. And I heard some really cool guitar tones with that microphone. Let's see, sweet. Dwarf. See everything taken. We're fun to watch. Thank you. That's where oh, here to have some fun, man. Juan, we're gonna be talking, man. Wow, look at that. 450 at Sweetwater. Holy crap. Yeah, that's the mic I saw. Yeah, I heard some really great guitar tones through that mic. Man. Wow. And Royer makes great stuff, man. Oh yeah, can't go wrong with that. Yeah, yeah. If you if you want smooth but still, you know, clean and, and breathy, oh it's they're great. They are great. Yeti said he had a 451 and used it on hi hat for an album and regretted it. Yeah, you know, I know, I know. A lot of people have used that mic over the years. It's a fairly famous one. I, if I need something uber bright, that's what I go to. I don't often need that type of uber bright. And on cymbals and drums, I don't like what it does, especially with off axis rejection. I used to use that as my second mic with my Pro 63 on the snare. And I really like the Pro 63 on a snare. It's a $50 dynamic mic that sounds great from Audio Technica. And then I would have the 451 next to it. And the 451 is a thinner sounding mic to me. And the off axis rejection was just. I was always fighting it a lot, which is why I switched to the SDC 84. Because I can still EQ that mic without having the hi hats kill me. And I know a lot of people use it on hi hats or ride an acoustic guitar. And I've heard some great sounding albums that they said the acoustic was recorded with a 451. It sounds amazing. <laughs> I can't argue with that. For me personally, I haven't had a lot of luck there. So maybe it's my gear, my preference. I don't know. So, All those things. So this one is still passive, right? Yeah. The R10. Is it passive? I don't know. I'm just reading. Uh, let's see. Wow, 160 dB of SPL. Holy crap. Yeah, that can handle. Wow. Yeah, it's the choice. Electric, acoustic, brass, strings, drums, cymbals. Isn't the the 421 is hypercardioid, right? Uh, I don't know. I don't know, actually, either, because I actually don't own one. You do. That's what I thought I'd ask. Yeah. I mean, I never really cared f uh, about that part. <laughs> I just had, I just know it has five, uh, uh, settings in the back you can turn but i always leave it on the first one so sometimes you know you have options on the gear you have but never try it try it so i think look again though i'm not sure that's a passive ribbon no right i don't think so because 160 man okay um great specs i mean it, the ribbon you, know, you think about it but just by nature the way it handles the transient is going to give you a lot of headroom there but the old one's gonna be sensitive don't go putting a 4038 on a kick drum you'll instantly regret it okay studio live ribbon let's see let's see it's a passive mono oh it is passive yep holy crap look at that wow well uh, that's a, I got another phone call to make. Yep. Okay, let's write that one down. R and R, the dual cap, the AT, the A twenty five. I have one of those. I know it's intended as a kick drum mic, and that's where I like it the least. <laughs> uh, it's pretty cool on a snare, especially if you take the giant capsule off. You can get it. You can tuck it right in there, and it does a nice job. And I love it on a bass cab. Personally never got something that I was totally, not that it was bad because it wasn't, but I just never got anything that went, oh, that's my kick sound. I've been able to do that more with a the ATM 250 and then my choice of either the Mini K47 KD, which is the kick drum version of the 47, or uh, and or the 4047 on the outside. <laughs> Ty, what time is it? Holy crap, you're looking out. Good looking out, man. Yep. It is about Chipotle time. Yep. I know Ernesto's not excited about that. He, I eat Chipotle all the time, and he's like, oh, man. No, I love it. W w once in a while, it's, I'm fine. No problem. 
All right, guys. It is uh, 7.45. is about that time. Anyway, I hope, like I said, just conceptually talking about picking mics, just ideas on how to pick your next round of mics, thinking of them as part of your, the start of your mix, starting to think about how your music's going to sound down the road and not just at that moment and d- developing that ear for that. I hope this all helped a little bit. These are all concepts that you can take and run with however your subjective perception of things is. And it's all different. That's beautiful. That's how all this should be. But anyway, that's it. We're going to go. We've got some mics to look up. Juan will be talking soon. Um, everybody else, we'll see you next week. We'll be back on Tuesday. We've got next video coming out with uh, Rick, the bass, on Monday. I've got a, We did a very short drum reamp one for this one because I only did one set of mics for a specific reason. That'll be next Thursday. And then the following week, the mix video comes out for Circus Tuesday and the song will be released. In the meantime... We got the new Master Fader shirts out. Woohoo! There's links Yay. in the description. They're all available at the uh, Ultimate Studios Inc. store, as well as the No Coffee, No Recording coffee mug, which I need to, I'm waiting on. It hasn't come in yet. And then it will be replaced here. So check out the Facebook group. We can chat and see everybody's stuff in between these broadcasts. And until then, everybody stay safe. And record some music and share the music. That's important too. You got to record yes. it. You got to finish it. You got to share it. You know what I'm saying? You All right, you guys. Bad? Thanks for uh, hanging with us. Always a blast. Yep. We'll see you next Tuesday. Take care. <laughs>